So, but it's permissible if there's no other alternative. But I think there is an incredible secret here to the success of Muslim marriages. In the Muslim world, we see that the divorce rate has barely reached 10%. It's usually stayed under 10%. And we know that in other parts of the world, it's come up to 50% and surpassed it. Now, this isn't because women don't have the right to divorce or can't divorce. We see explicitly that they do have that right. It is because it has to be a huge issue that God does not want to see a broken home. And that is something that they themselves know from the Quran when it states, this is in your handout, this verse, I believe. It states that, verily, if you don't like something in your spouse, you will find many other things that are good characteristics. We all are not perfect, but it has to be a huge, serious issue for a divorce to take place. Now, 10. The right to sexual satisfaction from her husband. This is actually a very interesting component of Islam. The woman, we've talked about Eve and how she wasn't seen as a sinful being in the Islamic perspective, but also um, sexual satisfaction or pleasure inside of a marriage never made... Uh, Muslims weren't ever thinking of themselves as we tend to think of them today as prudes. You know, this word prude. No, actually, Prophet Muhammad was very frank and candid when he talked to his followers about this. And he said, you will get a reward from pleasing your spouse. And his followers said, oh, Prophet, what, we have no other alternative. What do you mean? Adultery is forbidden. And he said, wouldn't it be a sin to commit adultery? And they said, yes. And he said, so you are rewarded for giving that pleasure to your spouses. And this frank and candid uh, atmosphere, environment in Islam has never given the connotation that this is a weakness of the flesh, that this is a sinful act, which existed in other cultures, that even within marriage you thought there's something. But Muslims see it as a God-given right, that it is very natural and to satisfy human needs inside the bounds that Allah, that God placed, inside the limits of marriage, is the best alternative, is truly the right way to live. We never see the issue of celibacy come up with um, Muslim leaders. Uh, like, um, and that was historically um, what happened in the Catholic tradition and other religions and asceticism that uh, promoted celibacy. Because to the Muslim, it is a very natural way to live, even for the Muslim clergy, even for the leaders of the Muslim nation. And now, 11, custody of children after divorce, guaranteed for a woman in Islam, and the right to refuse any marriage. There is no forced marriage with this idea. And this was upheld in Prophet Muhammad's own time over and over again. People came to him, girls and women said, you know, I, I wasn't consulted about this marriage, or I don't want to marry this person that my parents say. And he said, then it's over. It is, it is uh, within your rights to see each other, to consult, and there is no, uh, a woman or a girl, there's no way, it's outside of Islam for her to be forced in any way or coerced into a marriage. Now look, let's look at one of the definitions of marriage in the Holy Quran. And among his signs is this, that he created for you mates from yourselves, that you may find rest and peace of mind with them. And he ordained between you love and mercy. Verily, in that indeed are signs for people who reflect. Now, maybe I should write, since, since they've been so kind to give me markers and a board, I will write what, what one of the words uh, that's discussed. in verses like these in the Qur'an means. There's a concept of second in Arabic. Second is a place of residence, a house or a dwelling. And we see that it has an additional meaning that's related to this word, sakina. My handwriting is not great anyways, and I don't, you're not gonna be able to tell, but it's not great Arabic, but <laughs> sakina. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, thank you for agreeing. Now, Sakina, who can hear a, a closeness between second and Sakina? Right, it sounds. This is an Arabic worldview because they come from the same source, the same roots. Second is a place of a house, a place of dwelling, but it has a connotation 
of peace and tranquility. Where you live is a, pe- is a place of peace and tranquility. Sakina means serene, stillness, peace of mind, happiness. We don't see this, for instance, in a word house, right? House is a place where we live. It has no added spiritual layers or metaphysical layers of, of peace, right? You might find peace, you might. But it's embedded in the Arabic worldview that there is, in marriage, in a place where you dwell, should be a place where you find rest and peace between the spouses. And this is incredible as, fed, as the foundation, setting up or establishing the foundation of marriage as love, as a place of love and peace. And now we begin to talk about one of the most incredible women role models, probably in the history of the world. I wouldn't say just in Islam, but it's because we know so little about her. More should be written about her, more should, should be re- uh, uh, spoken about her. Aisha was one of Prophet Muhammad's wives. She was young, so one of the common controversial discourses in the West is about Muhammad marrying a young girl. And Muslims say, some Muslims will say, you know, God has reasons for doing things, and there are some things in the unseen that we don't know. We don't know why happened. Actually, this is far from being true. The magnitude of evidence we have about Aisha's role to us today is incredible. And she is a sign from God. I think that she is just irrefutably a sign of God. Aisha was young when she married Prophet Muhammad. Even though she became older, she was 27. Now, if he was, number one, if he was, as some people say about him, that he was playing around, then all of his wives would be young. She's the only young one. She's the only virgin. All the other wives are his age or older. All of them have been divorced or widowed twice, sometimes or once. Some of them have many, many kids he has to care for. And then, as Aisha got older, he could have, like we see people doing today, playing with somebody and tossing them aside, all of his marriages. And that means a commitment to take care of financially, emotionally, a huge investment of a life and time. They are commitments that last to the end of his life. Now, what's incredible about Aisha is that she's young. She has an extremely great intellect and an amazing memory. She is able to record for us his life, and especially private moments, what transpired. She is so honest with herself, with others, I mean, about herself, that even situations that make her look bad, she relates them to us. So there's an instance, there are many instances related in the Quran. Also, the same thing about Prophet Muhammad, he made mistakes. Now, if it was his own writing, he would want to make himself look good, and he wouldn't have told us about these mistakes. Same thing with Aisha. She wouldn't have told us about these things that make her that much more human, but of course make her a very fallible individual. So once it's related that um, a woman came to ask Prophet Muhammad questions, and and, uh, Aisha went to answer the door, and Muhammad said, who was it? And she said, oh, the short one. So a derogatory and insult, the short one. He said, you've just said a word that if it was mixed with clear water, it would muddy the water. If it was mixed with water, that word, it would muddy the water. And he's always teaching her this high morality and ethic. She relates that about herself. She lets us know so that we can learn that kind of morality that was taught to her, these kinds of ethical teachings, even though it puts her in a bad light. Now, Aisha ends up being responsible for one-fourth of all Islamic religious teachings. One-fourth of our teaching as Muslims comes from this great lady. That is not, this is what I mean by irrefutable evidence that she is a sign from God, that she was placed there for a reason. Now, it ends up, she, she recorded 2,210 narrations of Muhammad. 297 are in the most rigorously authenticated category. They were compiled by two great scholars. Their names are Al-Bukhari and Imam Muslim. That's a huge number for them to be in there. Then 300 students, over 300 students, have narrations from her because she taught. So all of her life, after Muhammad's death, she had an extensive life also. 